So we're diving into Revelation, trying to kind of simplify it. Uh, it's a book that sometimes can be overwhelming. And we find in Revelation 14, there's this passage, the three angels message that kind of kind of condenses the whole message of Revelation, right? It kind of um, brings a synopsis mm -hmm. of that. It's a centrality, if you will. Yeah, 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 definitely. And so I think it helps us to understand and also to focus in the real message of Revelation, right? So for example, it starts out this way in Revelation 14, 6. It says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And so like the focus here, like the main thing that it starts out with from the beginning is, is the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when people talk about revelation, that's not always the center, is it? People kind of bring all kinds of different ideas, yeah, well, right? Well, there's a lot of things in there. There's beast and there's yeah. dragons and there's so many different things, right? <laughs> yeah. People are yeah. singing and so a lot of people are saying, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. But the purpose of it is this gospel. That's right. Yeah. I I've even heard someone say, I wish Revelation was never written, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But it's there, you know, it and helps. it's important. We get caught up with all of the, the imagery. Like I can remember being a kid mm -hmm. and just like having to muster up the courage to go read Revelation hmm. because it, it seemed like such a scary book from the outside. All the stuff you just mentioned, like there's all this crazy yeah. stuff going on and that's just some of it. That's just the, the uh -huh. middle piece here that people really get concerned about, but uh -huh. there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And then we skip over verse one, right? Yeah. Which right. says we, that we, this yeah. is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which has yeah. been given to him, right? This is, this yeah. book's purpose is to reveal Jesus. So it's, it's, it's central to us being able to understand something yeah. about Jesus. So to keep the focus on him and not let it devolve into this, this focus on antichrist, but to keep the focus Christ. And I think that's really the challenge yeah. that many people face when they come to this book is that they get so caught up and so distracted by antichrist. What's antichrist doing? How is this all playing together? What's the new world order doing? What are all, you know, all this stuff starts to come in looking for the devil instead of looking for Jesus in the book. This is all about because a lot of times people are avoiding revelation because of this term prophecy. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we get caught up on that word. But man, talking with you, Wes, earlier, mm -hmm. you have this great overview of what prophecy is. And I think that'll really help uh, help our audience. It really helped me. Yeah. So the, the thing that, that has really been significant about the purpose of prophecy to me is when we look at what the Bible tells us prophecy is for. Like in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, We have the, more, the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises hmm. in your hearts. Hmm. And Jesus in hmm. Matthew 24, when he was talking to disciples, he says, See, I've told you these things beforehand so that when they come to pass, you may believe. And so the purpose of prophecy is, is really to help yeah. us come to know Jesus. And once we know Jesus, now prophecy has fulfilled its purpose yeah. in, in that it's gotten us to Christ. Yeah. And so now as we're looking at um, different things unfolding from a timeline perspective of, you know, mm -hmm. the Antichrist is going to come or the plagues are going to happen or whatever these things are, oh. these are not necessarily warnings for the world, but they're to confirm our faith that as we see things happening, we're... Yeah. affirmed that what we have believed is true, that the, the prophetic word we have in Scripture that has led us to know Christ can be trusted, and yeah. that grounds us in Christ. Mm. Yeah. We don't have yeah. to have a blind faith. You know, yeah. I was an atheist for a long portion of my life, and it was actually prophecy that changed my mind that the Bible was actually trustworthy. And mm -hmm. so step by step, I began to say, oh, maybe you can actually... Uh, you know, believe some of the Bible. Cause mm -hmm. I used to, people, my name's Christian. People would be like, Oh, are you a Christian? And I'd be like, no, you're, you're, I would say a lot of things that I wouldn't say today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, uh, for a little bit, I was like, okay, well maybe, maybe this book is trustworthy and then, okay, maybe this book is trustworthy. And it started to then dive into that deeper relationship with Christ. And so it did that very purpose. And that, as you say, that's the purpose of it, right? Is to draw us to him, to help us to know that we can trust him. And, and I think that's so important for us to, to share and discuss and talk about in today's climate, because there's so many different um, voices out there when we're talking about prophecy, when we're talking about revelation, especially, you know, in the time of the pandemic and all these things, there's all these different theories that are pushed and oftentimes in kind of a, uh, a mean, you know, vindictive way. Right. 
and we're missing the point of Revelation altogether. And I think we need that point more than ever before. Yeah, and I think here in in Revelation 14, when we're opening here, right, this is this kind of like pinnacle of the book. Mm-hmm. And when you understand structure, it's bringing emphasis here. Yeah. And so these three messages are not arbitrary. Like there's angels everywhere, but these three hold like a, a, a central point in the book mm-hmm. structurally. And when you look at the messages as we're going to unpack them here, you know, as we're talking, these three messages kind of encapsulate the yeah, the the the, in, the, in, the end piece, that kind of yeah. central part. But it starts here with the gospel. The first angel comes mm-hmm. with the everlasting gospel to preach. And so, I, you know, that becomes very, very important, especially when you look at the juxtaposition between this message mm-hmm. and the next two messages and the connections that I'm sure we'll, we'll dig into, is that you have to have this gospel piece right. Yeah. Because the gospel is about what Jesus has done, not what about not about what I have done, yeah. and so we have to kind of get that perspective right. Back again in Revelation chapter one, there's this verse that I think really encapsulates the gospel, which is it's talking about um, Jesus and the message that He has mm-hmm. for the world, and it says to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins mm-hmm. by His blood. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so forgiveness is available to us, and that is the gospel. Yeah, and and. You know, it's not just that forgiveness is available, it's that it has always been. Yeah. There's yeah, that passage been. that calls no. Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yep. And so there's always been forgiveness. There's never been a moment where mm-hmm. you weren't forgiven. It's just a question of whether you will acknowledge it and receive it. That's the whole question. So I, I love that definition of the gospel that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, yeah. all can be saved. Yeah. Not will be because we have to make a conscious choice to say, Mm -hmm. I accept what you've done. I believe in what you've done. I'm a believer, Mm -hmm. and I know it's for me as well. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, um, that tie-in as far as it's accessible to everyone, you Mm -hmm. know, as it says, every nation, tribe, tongue, kindred, and people, you know, that this everlasting gospel is available. So often we, we say, oh, it's for him or her, but we feel like it's not available to us. But no, that's the message, right, for us to trust him with it. Uh, sometimes maybe scripture can feel a little complicated because there are things that are put into symbolism, right? And yeah. could you speak to that a little bit? Like why why is why are there symbolic things in scripture? Is it to make it more difficult for us to understand or is there a deeper thing behind it? Well, as we see symbols, symbols oftentimes are... And that's what I love about the scripture. Mm-hmm. The symbols are congruent with the rest of scripture. Yeah. Uh, and they're there. You will see beasts that represent kingdoms and powers, all these different things. Yeah. But God is showing us that he has been with us since the beginning, since the foundation. Yeah. And he'll continue to be with us. And that we don't have to be afraid because he knows what's coming. Yeah. And he knows uh, that he's going to be with us. And we can choose to be with him because we can be on mm-hmm. the winning side. Yeah. Uh, if you read the beginning of Revelation, you read the end, you see that God wins. Mm-hmm. And we can choose to win with him. Yeah. But yeah. it's our decision. Yeah. Uh, and once again, I'm, I'm using that those terms, you know, being mm-hmm. facetious. But uh, winning and losing is whoever has the son of God has life. Yeah. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Yeah. If you want this everlasting gospel, it is centered in Jesus Christ. And we have to choose to have him. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture of, you know, when you compare Genesis 1 with Revelation 21, Mm -hmm. and that you get in the beginning, you have the people that God created living in paradise Mm -hmm. with God. And and then the the book concludes at the end of Revelation, you once again have everything restored, Mm -hmm. where the people of God are living in paradise Mm -hmm. with their God. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I mean, that in and of itself encapsulates, like everything that's come in between has been about like God seeking to restore that he wants for us. everyone. Yeah. 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 He wa- I mean, that's, yeah. that's, a, I think that's an important thing for people to get is that God actually wants you. Yeah. It's not that, it's not that like, oh, he might, if you prove yourself and if you're good enough and if you get things yes. together, yeah. it's that, that God has loved you yeah. your entire life. Yeah. And, and even right now, if you don't feel like you're good enough, God still loves you. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm so glad you shared that because for a long part of my life, I thought God wanted my obedience and I thought mm-hmm. God wanted mm-hmm. my perfect behavior. I thought God wanted my money, mm-hmm. but God wanted me. Yeah. He wanted a relationship with me yeah. yep. and he would add the obedience. He would mm-hmm. add the the yeah. wanting to give mm-hmm. those other things. But first mm-hmm. centrally yeah. is a relationship with yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 No, it's so key. And, and something I thought of not too long ago that just I felt like really highlighted how much God loves us is, you know, if you look at creation, right? Six days. Look at 
redemption, how long it's taken. Mm-hmm. Like if I was in God's shoes, I'm zapping myself out of existence. <laughs> I'm starting over, you know, and that let just, them destroy themselves. You know, um, it just amazes me at, at the depth of love that God has. He doesn't want to lose his, his, his people, mm-hmm. his children. Yeah. Love it. No, that's, you know, th- that has been the, the game changer for me in my life is hmm. realizing that it's not about, it's not about what I do. Like, Period. Mm-hmm. You know, there there is there is a sense in which, you know, the life that we live outside of Christ is a life that is less than. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm in Christ and I realize who God is and, and all the good things that he has for me, absolutely. Like things are going to start changing in my life. But if if I don't have Christ, then I don't have life. And if I don't have life, those things don't matter. Yeah. And so you know, there there comes this place where you've got to you, your motivation has to be correct. Like you have mm-hmm. to be moving from this place of life and light. And I think that that's an interesting thing when you start looking through Scripture in the New Testament, especially the way that the life of the believer is described. It's always in dichotomies, oh. and it's always in mutually exclusive dichotomies. It's light and dark. It's mm-hmm. life and death. It is sinner and it is saint. It is yeah. free and it is slave. And you cannot be a little bit of light and a little bit of dark. Mm. You're either light or you're dark. Mm-hmm. You're either alive or you're dead. Mm-hmm. And what the gospel tells us is that in Christ, we have been made alive with him. Amen. That in Christ, we are no longer of the flesh. We are of the spirit. And all of these things are mutually exclusive. Okay. And when we get that piece right, and we understand who we are, what Christ has given us because of his death and resurrection, yeah. that we have the same spirit in us, then everything that happens after that, anything that might change in our life, that's just a, a, an outflow of the new heart, right? Because if like you look at the, 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 the new covenant, yeah. right, is that it yeah. will take the old heart. The old heart, it's not like, oh, well, we'll give you a left aorta, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. new heart. <laughs> yeah. So there's a change in the yeah. fundamental center of who we are yeah. when we let Christ in. Yeah. And then life then is living, learning how to grow into that freedom, yeah. how to, how to re- perceive the light. You know, First John mm-hmm. it says, you know, that the light came and uh, the darkness did not comprehend it. Yeah. Right. right. So the darkness doesn't comprehend yep. the light. But if you if you're if you're in a place in your life where you're having a, a spiritual inclination, if you're having an awareness, you're comprehending the light. Yeah. Which means fundamentally that you are no longer in darkness. Yeah. And so. I mean, that is a powerful thing yeah. to get there. And this is the gospel. This is what's on offer. That's right. Is this new life. Yeah. That that is so powerful and so good because there's also an enemy, mm-hmm. right? Just mm-hmm. there's a God, and the yep. enemy would love to tell you that you're in darkness, yep. you're going to stay in darkness, that there is no light, but Christ is the light. Allow him in. Yeah. Flip that switch, right? Well, yeah. actually, he's the one flipping the switch. You just need to acknowledge it. Yeah. yeah. Acknowledge the light and, yeah. and walk towards it. Walk in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that that's like also something that's worth kind of noting here is that when we're talking about angels, and we're talking mm-hmm. about like the purpose of angels and all yeah. through Revelation, we see these yeah. angels. Angels only come to speak to people who believe in God. Yeah. And so one of the things that I think has caused a lot of people to struggle with with belief in God in the first place, to believe in Christianity, is that most Christians have taken and said, we're the messengers. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so prophetically, like the, the imagery of an angel is that we're supposed to be the messenger. Mm-hmm. And now the message that we have to give is not the message of the gospel, but it's the it's the beast. It's the Antichrist. It's the mark mm-hmm. of the beast. It's the, you know, the fall of Babylon. It's all mm-hmm. of these things. And so now we're preaching this message to unbelievers as an angel. But I can't find anywhere in Scripture where an angel speaks to an unbeliever. Mm-hmm. So the message that's being given, this prophecy is being unfolded, is not that we're supposed to preach to people that they need to be afraid of these things. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to preach the gospel in contrast to where they are. Mm -hmm. And so then as we see these things unfolding of the Antichrist coming in and the things that are there, that is confirming to us as believers, going back to that, what is the point of prophecy, that that what God has said is true, to encourage us that time is short. Yeah. There's an, we don't have much time. We have to let people know yeah. the yeah. good news yeah. of the gospel. And and so we have to preach to them Jesus and not Antichrist. Yeah. And that's where we get a little off track. 
and the, there's that that growing process, that journey, right? That's I, I don't think it's by mistake that this passage starts out with the gospel. I don't think it's by mistake mm-hmm. that Revelation one starts out that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, because that's that's the core message. That's the that's the stepping stone, and and then yeah, it grows us and helps us to understand. And and so often today we see people that um, you know will focus on sharing messages of revelation that aren't messages of hope, that aren't messages of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Messages of fear and doom. Of fear. And so uh, that makes it not a message of revelation or Mm -hmm. of scripture because we've missed the boat completely. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much in this book. I'm excited to dive into it. Yeah. um, Same here. it's, it's, It's just powerful stuff. Yeah, absolutely.